what is our duty as educators in encouraging civic responsibility in vitriolic times? I, I think it's our huge responsibility as social studies teachers just in general to teach civic skills and knowledge and um, implant the seed that their voice and their, um, their voice and their vote can make a real difference in our society. I think we need to, as teachers, do that. No matter if we teach civics or regular government or regular US history or world history, we need to plant civics, the idea, in all of our courses. I think too, part of it, like there's so much happening right now that's, you know, I told my seniors last semester, like in 20 years, your kids are going to be learning about this. Like the, the time you're living through now and civics isn't a passive thing. You know, when I was reading John Lewis's um, last letter and he said, democracy is not a state, it is an act. Like that to me is, is everything. It is it's not time to just sit and get like, that's not what civics is. And it's such an important thing, you know, especially again, the times we're in being an active participant. And even if you don't know what to do, just, you know, learning about things and reaching out. And I think the really like amazing thing about being a social studies teacher is that our content is always happening. It's always relevant. There's always something and it's such a powerful thing. I would concur with both Melissa and Elizabeth. Uh, you know, I think that I'm, I'm, a, I'm in my forties. And so one of the things that I would just over the weekend, I was, I was uh, on vacation with some friends and they were asking me questions about the electoral college of all things. And our conversation meandered. It was lovely. It was the side of the ocean. You know, we were like just chilling out. And I think one of the things that strikes me when I talk to people of my generation is that what our civic education was, was not active. It was very much so, this is the three branches, here's what they do. There's not a lot of inquiry in terms of why are they structured like that? What does that mean? Does it have to be like that forever? What is your role? And I think um, as an adult, for me, the one thing that comes up all the time and all of the reading that I do is that I recognize that guess what? I wasn't intended to be a participant. I never was. I mean, it's by, you know, an act of courage from people who preceded me that I get to be at the table. But that table was barred for me forever. And I think that when you have students who walk in, they are, they are active. They are asking questions. My 14 year old told me she thinks that politics is cool and she doesn't want to do politics. She wants to go save the energy crisis. You know, she, she says, my friends and I talk about politics. We want to know more about how things work and how things don't work because this is a part of their vernacular. And so when they come into us, it is, it's not like a duty, it's a privilege that we get to talk to them about being active participants and dispelling myth and rumor and on misunderstandings that, you know, their parents might have or that sometimes I have. I mean, that's the amazing thing is I'm learning alongside them too. So it really is, um, it's super vital. It's super vital if we want, you know, if, if we want to hand this down to the next generation. Um, and I, I just- Babe, are you hungry now? Do you want me to- Oop, I just wish that we had, um, you know, more support, I guess, for making civics more active in general. I find they're so much more engaged. When I first started teaching, it's totally changed. Now they come in, they're so motivated and like excited to register to vote. And like, they, like I hype it up. I have the board of elections come in. They get so excited to register to vote. Um, and just the process of being engaged with current events and bringing that into class, I feel like it just makes it so much more fun to teach. When you're right, Jennifer, and I think it was said in the chat, like my civic education was a sit and get. It was, here is the lecture, here is the worksheet, here is the test. Now we're going to watch a video because, you know, whatever. And I didn't really understand the gravity of what civic education should be until I started teaching. 
And it's such a, it's very interesting because, you know, I'm going to be 40 this year. I graduated from high school in 1999 and it wasn't like, that's not what civic ed was. And I remember, you know, when the recession happened and the previous district I was in was kind of crumbling and I went to a board meeting to just basically say like, you can't treat teachers the way you're treating them to our school board. And the person in front of me, you know, gave a speech and they were like, you know, kids these days don't even know who wrote the Monroe Doctrine and they don't know dates and we need to get back to the basics. And I went up after and I was like, I mean, I have a bunch of stuff to say, but I'd really like to address the fact that nobody cares who wrote the Monroe Doctrine. What we care about is what does the Monroe Doctrine say? Like, how does that apply to history? And when you look at things, it's not just knowing dates. Like that is, they can Google that. Why? We are not that. That is not what civics is. And again, maybe for you and for me too, that's what it was for us, but that's not ever what it should be. And I don't think it's ever going to be that way again. Um, it's getting them to critical consumers of the media, critical consumers of civic knowledge. I feel like, like I was thinking of the example I have them instead of just researching how a bill becomes a law, we track a bill that's going through Congress. So they're researching how the bill's going through, who proposed the bill, what's the bill going to affect, rather than just saying a typical, this is how a bill becomes a law. Let's research something in action of actually happening with our government right now. One of the funny things, uh, when I was in high school, I knew I wanted to study politics, but I hated U.S. history. I mean, guys, I hated it. I was like, if I have to sit down and listen to one more war and listen to one more date, I'm going to scream. It was not my thing. Um, but when I, when I, cause I had a, my father studied political science as an undergrad. Um, and he would come home and he would give me political philosophy books and I would read them as an eight as an eighth grader. So of course I was like such a nerd. But I think that when I told my friends in high school that they that I wanted to study political science, they looked at me like, What's wrong with you? You know you're not gonna make any money doing that. Number one. Number two, politics is horrible. It's for like old people. Why would you do that? It's so gross. I just, I find it so inspiring that this generation is exactly the opposite of that. It is without fail that e like every year I have kids who come into my, into my classroom who are so enthusiastic. They've already done stuff in politics. They've already, you know, they've volunteered, they've gone out and they've registered voters. I've got kids who are working in nonprofits. I've got kids who've written letters to the editor. I mean, they're just doing things because they know that they do make, they, they have a point to make. And I think that we have a remarkable opportunity to capitalize on that um, excitement and um, efficacy that they have. I mean, my goodness, yay for them that they have efficacy because I did not when I was their age. <laughs> okay, great. Along those lines, and there was a question from the audience, how many of us think our civic responsibility in actively think our civic responsibility toward a common good and then act upon it? So say, for example, the mask and vaccine debate at the central question. You know, I've always really struggled with this because I'm a classic overachiever. Like I'm the firstborn of three girls um, I'm the firstborn of a firstborn of a firstborn and so on and so forth. And if, you know, when the state of Arizona, uh, when there was the walkout and, you know, there's hundreds of people, not hundreds, thousands of people on red shirts marching, you know, I, t I took my daughter down there to show her like, this is what it is. And, you know, you get so caught up in these things, but I think the biggest part of me that engages in civics is by being a civics teacher because I get to, you know, my, my biggest thing is my job is not teach to teach. I can't even talk today. My job is not to teach kids what to think. It's to teach them how to think. So it doesn't matter, you know, what you want to go do in the political world, even if it is something as simple as, you know, as a citizen, I'm going to be a good model. 
So if part of that being a good model is making sure I'm wearing a mask or, you know, socially distancing, or if I don't agree with something going about it in a way that's not, I'm just going to, you know, fire something off online really quick because I'm so angry. It's a conversation with somebody you don't agree with to understand, okay, so why do you think this? Because I don't. And I, I'm, I'm listening to understand, not fight with you because a active engagement in civics and active engagement in things like, I mean, I don't know about your states, but the state of Arizona and the mask requirement is that it's baffling to me how politically divided it is. Um, but I think sometimes we forget just the act of speaking to somebody that you don't agree with or that you want to learn more from is being civically active and having those conversations because I was reading a book today um, and they were talking about how, you know, we're all buried in our phones and we're not looking at each other. So a lot of the things people say to each other online or say about each other online, you'd never say that to a person's face. So the act of engaging in civics by talking to somebody or by just understanding or having, you know, the ability to research, obviously using good sources. Um, but to me, I think that teaching is the ultimate, I mean, one of the ultimate acts of like applying your civics. I mean, I think especially since uh, Elizabeth, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, um, well, no, I don't, you work at a private school? I, I don't, remember. I actually work at a nonprofit now. I was at a public school. Okay, you were at a public, okay. Yeah, very public school. Um, the act of working in a public school is, is a whole nother level of, of kind of putting you in the limelight. But, um, but I've worked, I mean, I've worked prob public, private. Um, I work for a governor's school now. So I'm, I'm kind of all over the map. And I agree, education really is like, there's just nothing more civic that I can think of. But I think it's interesting about the question is I would actually invert this and ask the question this way what in my life is not civically engaged? And I struggle to think about what I'm doing that's not out there in the public eye. Um, and I think that, you know, like, just, just think about how you go about interfacing with your community on a daily basis. Today, I didn't do anything all that fancy. I went and walked over to my kid's school to pick something up from them. I'm interfacing with the school staff, right? I'm wearing a shirt that's got a message on it. I'm sure that that's conveying a certain aesthetic, as the kids would say. I, you know, I went to Whole Foods. I went shopping. I wore a mask there. I, you know, said thank you to my workers. I thank them for being at, you know, being at Whole Foods so that I can go buy strawberries, which is not essential as far as I'm concerned. You know, I put gas into my car. That's engaging community. So. And then it just kind of spirals from there on out. I'm active in Girl Scouts. I help my sons with their um, community sporting teams. Like I just am constantly out in the, the community's eyes. And that is, I think in flipping that question, um, I really think critically about every conversation that I'm gonna have with folks like on the side of a baseball diamond or as I'm walking my dog because all of those have some kind of, I mean, I, I guess it's me, I think everything is political. <laughs> so I'm constantly like, okay, like, <laughs> what's going on here? What's the feel I'm getting? What's, you know, what is this person, you know, conveying to me? Um, how can I understand them better? How can I figure out what their deeper story is if I ever wanted to talk to them about something that was more meaningful than, you know, whether or not there's, I don't know, sidewalks in our neighborhood. Um, and I, I bring that to my students as well, that everything they do, they're a part of a community unless they're living in Antarctica, but even then you're a part of a community. Like how are you conveying yourself digitally? How are you conveying yourself in real life? How are you helping your neighborhood out when there's, you know, when tragedy strikes, so on and so forth. Um, I think that that makes being civic engaged less stressful 
if you will. I mean, it doesn't feel like you just have to vote or you have to go to that protest in order to be civically engaged or you have to wear that shirt or you have to give money to that cause. Um, that's, that's not the case. It's, it's going to church. It's driving your car. It's saying hello to their neighbor. I mean, everything. So. I'm also constantly always thinking like when I see stuff in the media or around my community, what, how can I bring this into my classroom? So we had like, we had, they were going to build cell towers in our, in our town. So I went to the meetings just to think this is great civics. Like what, how can I bring this into my classroom and listening to public discourse about building a cell tower? Um, and I'm constantly thinking that way also and thinking how can I apply this to my classroom and how can my classroom come out of the classroom and apply what they're learning. So. Can I ask your opinion on something? Um, how are you all going to handle um, debate in this very difficult <laughs> bipartisan because I was speaking to my husband, I was in eighth grade when the 1992, it was Ross Perot and George H.W. and Bill Clinton. And I remember, you know, I grew up Democrat, but we, I was able to, you know, it, it, it like didn't even cross my mind that I was hating my opponent. It was more like just a disagreement. And then we went out to the recess yard and we all played together. These are very different times. Now I teach seventh grade geography, so I don't have to touch upon it, but it seems inevitable that, so that's all. I just don't know what to do. Interesting, because that was the second question, basically. I'm sorry. <laughs> How can educators maintain bipartisan yet facilitate uh, civic engagement when the classes can be polarized? Sorry, I, I can't say the whole time, but I just thought of that and I just had to. So I live in a very red community in a blue state. So um, we have kids that are extremely, extremely liberal and extremely conservative. And I find when I'm teaching, I'm constantly trying to be the devil's advocate. What would the other side say if I were really outspoken and liberal? I'd bring in the Republican perspective. I taught in central Pennsylvania and I was, I had to bring in the liberal perspective when it was a very Republican um, town. So like you got to kind of, I try to balance the perspectives and they often don't know which way I vote. And I think that that says a lot about a civics teacher. If you can be that politically neutral, which is very hard to do um, in the climate that we're in. So I really try to be politically neutral. I let the kids research. If they have a question about something, we research um, the controversial topic. And then they come in with two sides. I do debates in my class um, where we have structured debates and they have to, they get assigned a topic and they have to defend that statement, defend that thesis and, and defend that position. So it's, it's a skill that we got to teach um, and we have to address it. I teach, I teach sixth grade uh, social studies, but I also do sixth and seventh grade current events. And this is, this comes up every single day. Um, walking that tight line, um, that tight rope and really um, trying to, trying to grab them and get them involved. Um, we always have some kids who are, you know, they're very active, so they're very open. And then we have others that are silent. And I still haven't learned yet how to pull those silent ones out but I figure they're there they're listening you know life goes on they're going to hear some of this and and they, they get it they understand it especially my seventh graders um but it's it is definitely very difficult we have a, a we're a republican city um I'm in Illinois and we have a democratic basically a democratic state uh but uh but our town is pretty pretty right. So anyway, that's my take. I, I use this source. I was going to show this no matter where we started talking about it, but I use all sides to do current events. When I do current events in class, I make them when we do a current event, they have to pull an article from the right and an article from the left and compare the same current event topic. How are the two sides portraying the current event? So, um, and we do current events every Friday and it really starts a really great discussion Fridays. They look forward to coming to class. I'm still trying to figure out how I'm going to do it virtually. I think I'm going to use Flipgrid to do this and where they present their current events, but they have to choose an article from the right, an article from the left, and it shows, and they have to analyze the, the message of the cartoon. So I use that it, site. Is that, um, would that be age appropriate for yeah. mine? Sixth yep. and seventh? Yep. 
It's great. Right. great. And, yeah, no, I, I also, I'll put it in the chat. But allsides.com, it's an unbiased news source. So they're not pulling sources that are really, um, they're pulling a right and a left. And there's even a center if you want to see a center article too. So yes, very appropriate. So Flip for me, side does the same thing. I don't know if anybody's used Flipside, but um, they have left and right as well. I put it in the chat. Do they say it's left or right? Yes, clearly. You can, the, the headline is blue or the headline is red. Oh, wow. So it's very, as is all sides. So for me, I mean, I had, we, I, I teach in a very politically divided um, district um, and I teach AP government, like <laughs> this, this is it. Um, and so my first thing that I always tell them is my opinion and things is not relevant here. Um, I'm the facilitator of learning. So I'm going to ask you questions. And, you know, when we look at things, our whole thing is do no harm because um, after the 2016 election, there was just so much hate and just it was awful. And I finally sat them all down and was like, what is our goal here? Because if our goal was to hate each other, we just don't need to be in this class together because it's not a thing. But if our goal is to learn from each other and if you can, you know, understand things and, you know, you know your kids and you know your classroom. Um, but one of the years we were talking about the whole woman's health versus Heller said on abortion, um, and we just did a deep dive for that. Like, why is this controversial? Let's look at the history of the controversy. Let's look at why, you know, a person of a certain demographic or a certain religion or in a certain part of the country thinks the way that they do. Because again, you know how you feel and maybe you don't know why, um, but it's important to understand what the opposition is. And there's not always just one side. You know, especially with a hugely controversial topics, there's tons of sides because everybody's looking at it with a different pair of glasses. Like everybody has a different lens. So let's look at this. And, you know, my biggest thing with talking about controversial topics, I mean, we talk about gun control, we talk about abortion, we talked about the transgender rights case, they did a moot court on it. And it's, we're looking at the law. <laughs> We're looking at why the law is the law, what the application of the law is, and the history of that. Um, and it's a very clinical approach. Like we're historians or we're political scientists, so let's start digging in. Because for me, it's not important for kids to leave my class with a fully formed opinion. For me, it's important for kids to leave my class knowing that if they don't necessarily know something or they hear something that sounds like, hmm, I'm not really sure about that, that they have places that they can look or in the classroom, we've created a community of, you know, somebody coming in and being like, hey, you know, this senator, or this representative did this. Can they do that? That's a really good question. <laughs> like, let's look. Because again, my opinion is not relevant. My, that's not my job. I am facilitating you in your learning journey. Because for me, I had to be very, you know, conscious of, you know, we have very, very conservative families in our community. We also have very liberal families and no student, you know, for me should ever be in my classroom and feel like they don't fit in and feel like, well, if I say anything, I'm going to get jumped on. If I, you know, disagree, I'm going to get jumped on. If you disagree, the question should always be, well, why do you think that? Why do you feel that way? And the voting thing always cracks me up because, you know, we talk about demographics of who, like, and again, generalizations. Liberals tend to be this. Conservatives tend to be this. Most people, like, kind of fit in the middle. And they'll say, oh, well, then you're this. And it's like, again, why is that relevant? Because if you asked 20-year-old Liz how she felt, she's going to feel different than 40-year-old Liz. Because 20-year-old Liz is in college. She is single. She is living her best life. And I'm living my best life at 40, but I have a home. I am married. I have a child. You know, my husband and I are public school, like people. It, it changes over time and it's okay for you to change as you grow and develop. And with everything happening right now, 
you know, for me, it was a hard look of what do I not know and how do I need to challenge myself to be better? And I think Jennifer does this really well <clears throat> because every time she posts a book, I add it to my Goodreads because it's for me, I want to know more about things I don't know about. And the first step for me is saying, that's a really good question. I don't know. Let's, let's start to look. Let's, again, all be in this learning journey together. I totally agree. Uh, reading is like number one on my list. Um, okay. So I, Liz and Melissa were like totally on the mark with, you know, we have to, we, this is our job. Our job is to, is to walk them through these extended controversies. Remember like no other curriculum out there has the expectation that we're talking about what's happening in our world today. This is it. Civics is it. And when I talk to other teachers about their knowledge about America and American government, they always come back and say like, I just don't think they did a good enough job when I was in school. So my walk away, like, here's how I would handle it would be as follows. Number one, um, like I, I don't advertise what I am, but all my kids know, and I don't really care if they know, I mean, because I never talk about my own politics. The job that I'm there to do is like, like Liz said, to facilitate conversations. So teach them the skills of what they need to do in order to be able to have these conversations. What I do is if there's, so for instance, um, Last year, there was, you know, obviously there was the impeachment and the students came in, they had lots of questions. I wasn't on that unit at that point in time, but I recognized that if I didn't have a conversation that I was going to lose interest and it would, it would do, it would, they would be like, this is ridiculous. Like, why are we not talking about the elephant in the room? So instead of talking about headlines, which I never want to do because Covington Catholic, I remember Covington Catholic as like the number one time where I had it wrong. And I opened my mouth and I talked about it in class just enough where I came in the next day and I had to eat crow and say, hey guys, I don't know enough about this, never again. Will I ever get up on a soapbox and start talking about something that is a developing story? Who knows what's gonna happen? I still don't know what happened with that and I don't want to know either. Um, so what, our job is, is to frame it in the context of whatever your curriculum is. Instead of talking about what, you know, like he did this and she did this and this is going on in this committee. I took my kids back to the uh, Federalist 65, Federalist 68, and uh, I don't remember, there's another one, 67, I think. And we looked at the debate that was being had in terms of why do we have impeachment? If impeachment isn't, it's supposed to be a last resort, rarely used if ever, what are we supposed to be using? So we looked at Federalist 70, oh, it's elections. Well, what does that tell us? We looked at the debates that were being had by the anti-federalists. I dug back to 1787 and was like, we're just gonna look and answer the question, why do we have this? And then I allow the students to drive questions. Okay, so Miss Hitch, like what's, why, you know, like I had questions, the kids asked questions where I was like, this is fantastic. They brought me into the 20th Amendment. They brought me into the 25th Amendment. They brought me into the 22nd Amendment. They talked about, well, we need to reform this because there are still problems. Why can't the special prosecutor do X and Y? And instead of me answering those questions, my job is to say, we've gone beyond the curriculum and my job is to facilitate your research skills. So now what you need to do, my friends, is you need to do your own research. Um, teach them where to look instead of teaching them the answer. That's more important than anything you can possibly do at this point. Teach them how to decipher arguments and primary source documents from 1787, from 1688, from 2010. It doesn't matter. Give them both sides. These are some wonderful things here that we, we brought up with flip side and all sides. And um, there's some lovely resources on newslit.org that tell kids about um, media literacy and looking for fake news and for bias news. And they label biases helping kids digest that information. The museum has wonderful resources, short videos that you can punch into a Google form and have your kids walk out where they're developing these skill sets. And then inevitably they're going to want to talk about these things in your classroom. 
And to tell them that they can't have that conversation is to tell them that they are not allowed to be a part of civics. So let them have the conversation, teach them how to ask questions of each other, teach, and I usually, when I'm having uh, like debates about news, whatever, we, I use a methodology called the stasis methodology where I teach them how to digest um, articles for, um, and I can, I can find you guys a little blurb about what it is, but um, it's just a methodology that has them digest resources. And then they come in and for an entire 90 minute period, I say, okay, everybody was supposed to bring in uh, an article that is on any topic you want. You're in groups of eight. You are going to have a 20 minute conversation where you generate questions and you answer them. And you're going to tell me what you think the operational you know, what needs to be done about this as a result of your conversation. And I just walk around and listen to them. And my kids have talked about anything from, you know, generic drugs to legalizing marijuana. They always love talking about legalizing marijuana to climate change, to LGBTQ issues, to tax reform. To, I mean, everything, everything under the sun. And if you let them talk, that issue of the silent kids not necessarily feeling like they have a voice starts to dissipate because it's really hard for a lot of those kids to kind of like have an answer on command, um, especially when something where they don't really know how they feel about it. So if you create an environment in which they have to go through the skills of how to digest these resources and then have an, oh, let them have an open-ended conversation where the rules are you have to respect each other, you can't question each other's experience, and you have to expect that there isn't gonna be resolution on this issue, and that's perfectly fine. You might find that some of those kids start rolling into larger conversations because they've generated questions, they have points that they want to elaborate on in the future, so on and so forth. Some other things, um, I love the book by Matthew R.K., the first half is amazing. The second half, the, it's kind of gets belabored, but the first half talks about how to have, he's writing how to talk about race in a civics, in, a, in classrooms. Um, he's an English teacher. Um, I love it. It's like some, like an actual teacher talking to us about how to talk about controversial topics in the classroom. But he goes through in the first four chapters how to create community within your classroom so your classroom can support having controversial conversations and politics is controversial. So there's some really wonderful, like easy to do, easy to plug in structures that you have in your classroom where kids feel like they're welcome and they are going to be listened to. Um, and if you're looking for something to kind of like jump into, oh, well, like, what do we do with it now that we've talked about these things? Um, Generation Citizen has me drooling at the mouth. It just looks amazing. It's this like platform of curriculum where kids are forced to find issues that they like and to create a project around it, some kind of policy issues. So it's taking all of those lovely research skills that they have and it's making a whole classroom wide project that they're all working on. So like some our PBL stuff, like that's a big PBL issue there. It's lovely. Um, Mikva challenge is something that deals more with public speaking um, that I've done in the past too, that my kids have really enjoyed as well. Um, you know, so again, just to kind of like reiterate, I think, A, we need to have those conversations in our classroom because if we don't, then we're telling kids that they're not allowed to participate and that is not what we are here to do. Number two, you don't need to be a part of that conversation except to teach skills and content that support inquiry. Um, try to teach them the skills of how to digest the media, how to look for primary source documents, how to look at secondary source documents, whatever they might be. There's a whole bunch of stuff there create an environment in which kids feel like they can have some ownership and drive a little bit and give them something to give them like, you know, one big project at the end that is their kind of like guiding star on the horizon so that they have some kind of investment um, and you're boosting their efficacy at the end to say like, yes, I can write a letter. I can go to a town hall meeting, et cetera, et cetera. Sorry, I talked a long time. <laughs> It's great, which leads us up to the next two-part question. What are some of the ways that you include or have included current events into your classroom 
and how has teaching current events, civic responsibility enhanced your classroom? Thinking about PBL and civic engagement, responsibilities, et cetera. So I do current events Fridays where they bring in current events. They're each assigned one Friday, a marking period that they have to bring in a current event and they have to go to all sides to pick something um, and they have to connect it to the class and the content. So I find that they're bringing in stuff that we're learning about that week. Um, and it makes it very engaging and very um, interactive. I use Project Look Sharp. Um, I posted it in the chat. It's a great site for media literacy. And I usually set that as the foundation in the beginning of the course. And then we dive right into Current Event Fridays, the second week of school. And then um, they do that, use all sides to pick their current events and bring in both sides of this topic. And then it usually starts a pretty good discussion when they bring in both sides of what is the two sides saying about the topic. My students love Twitter. <laughs> And so we have a class hashtag um, that we use. <clears throat> so like for the State of the Union address, um, we played, we call it State of the Union bingo. I didn't make bingo cards, um, but it was, you know, as the president is speaking, again, we're being political scientists. We're not here to judge. But as the president speaking, where do you see his role as chief legislator? Where do you see, you know, his commander in chief role? Where do you see all of this? and they get really into it. Um, for me, current events is a daily thing because I teach, you know, governments, it's every day. It's so easy to find. And, you know, I'm an avid listener of podcasts. So I usually listen to NPR first thing in the morning and that usually has something for me. So there's a warm up. there's something, you know, I listen to the daily. Um, the biggest thing for me is at the end of each semester, we do a moot court. So, Unfortunately, we're not able to do it at the end of fourth quarter because we all know that fourth quarter was a dumpster fire of clown shoes. And we just needed to like, you know, be that support. But first semester, um, they did the um, Amy Stevens case and they took something that was current and they looked at a law from 1964 to determine how you know, how does this law apply here? How to, and, and again, it's a controversial topic, you know, even listening to um, oral arguments with them, you could kind of hear like, well, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And I think the biggest thing with current events is it kind of what Jennifer said, like, sometimes you don't know the whole story yet. I remember talking about impeachment when I was in high school, because Bill Clinton was being impeached. And then watching for the first time years later, Monica Lewinsky's TED talk about being cyberbullied and thinking to myself how much information I did not know. And then listening to the slow burn on it. And yes, slow burn, you all, oh, yes. They actually, I think the new season is like Biggie versus Tupac, but still super interesting. Um, but you don't always have all the information and, you know, and to be very frank, I did the same thing that Jennifer did when Covington, I was like, that's so disrespectful. I can't believe that. And I had to do the same thing. Like I'm a person and I judged and I was wrong. And it's okay to say that it's okay to say, wow, I got new information. This is not the same thing. And so for me, current events is how can, where do you see the application of what we're learning? Where do you see, the application of bureaucracy, you know, the real ID that you have to have a little star on your, um, on your license. Where do we see this application? And it becomes, it's just part of the day. It becomes as you're teaching kids are like, Hey, I saw something on the news today, or I heard something here. Or, you know, I saw this on Twitter because again, they're all like so into it and it's just bringing all of it in and again, facilitating learning and telling them this class, there's nothing in this class that you can say, oh, when am I ever gonna use this? Use it every single day. And if you don't know when you're gonna use it, we need to readdress that to make sure you understand what it is so that you can actually see it. Um, and again, it's just when you make it a part of your class and it's in part of that environment and it's showing them what you're learning is relevant, it's gonna be relevant today, it's gonna be relevant in 50 years, the relevancy is always going to be there. So that's the connection that you should be making. So I have about 25,000 PBLs, but I'm gonna to skip to um, 
something that I think has improved my classroom and the motivation of students to learn in a way that is a COVID keeper, if anything can be a COVID keeper. Um, and it actually started before COVID for me. So also love Twitter. Hi, all my Twitter friends. Like we're all Twitter friends, right? This is our digital PLN. Um, Twitter is amazing because you can talk to authors and they are like, hey, do you want me to come talk to your students? I cannot tell you how many times I've emailed somebody and like just the other day, I was reading a book, found another book in the footnotes. I was like, I need that book. It was out of print. I emailed the author. The author is like sending me proofs from the publisher and found an out of print copy for me and wants to come talk to my kid. I was like, oh. Oh my God. Okay. Yes. Like, yes, you may, anytime you want, you can come talk to my students. You can talk to my coworkers, anything. Um, it's, it's really like, I think that it's me three years ago would have been like, Oh, I don't, it's such a pain to like find people to come in and talk to students. I don't think anybody, no one has time for that. Two years ago, I had 30 speakers throughout the entire year. And every time I asked someone, they were like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Um, kids love it. They, some of my best stuff, like I had um, this year, I had, I found a special interest group that's all about, I teach at a SciTech high school. So it's a special interest group that's all about teaching master's level students how to go to Capitol Hill and to lobby for science technology application in the law. And I was just randomly sitting next to this woman and we started talking and she was like, this is what I do. And I was like, I'm obsessed with you. Will you come talk to my students? And she did. And she brought like somebody's chief of staff with her. And the, my kids were like, I mean, they were like, like, you know, like taking all of the notes because it was not me talking to them. So I would encourage you to reach out on Twitter and, and give it a whirl. I think one of my other favorite people was, this is the COVID keeper, Cheryl Amendola, who is also on the digital PLN, wrote a children's book. And that became one of the PBLs that I did for my, one of my AP Gov classes. They had to write a children's novel on race. And um, she talked to my students about her book. She like went through the experience. She talked to them about what it's like to publish. She talked, I mean, it was so, so cool. And it took like 25 minutes of her time. So um, I, I'm a huge fan of Zooming or Google chat or whatever it is, um, bringing people into your classroom because it, it makes, you know, you're, you're bringing in that wealth of information to students and they're going to ask questions that you would never think to and that you would never know the answer to. So, and yes, I'll, I'll share some PBLs. <laughs> I do the same exact thing, but I, um, I, we, I live an hour north of New York city. So a lot of our parents are very active in New York city and um, surrounding areas. So I, I put on my syllabus, um, do you do anything with the government? Are you involved in anything with politics or anything with, where do you interest in guest speaking? I find numerous speakers just from that. Like I've had an FBI come in. I had come in. Like I had all these different speakers. I have a judge. It's like, it just makes the class so much more engaging. So I agree with Jen. You know, what's funny is I didn't really ever like utilize it until we were doing a uh, Lee versus Tam on the slants and you know my kids are live tweeting or whatever and they're not supposed to be talking because we have court in session and what my they're like trying to get my intention and it's like i am trying to grade here and one of my kids goes fine i'm just i'm just done simon tam is tweeting with us right now like he is engaging so even like if you can't have guest speakers or you're like live too far away there are a lot of people that are just willing to engage with your kids and it's so cool because, you know, like has been said, like we're content experts and we know our kids, but sometimes it's just really cool to have somebody else come in and talk to your kids who have those different experiences. And I think it just creates such a rich environment. And it literally took me, it took that happening to me in a class 
to be like, this world is so much bigger than my classroom. What am I doing? I need to make this bigger than what it already is. I even just get them to follow different leaders on Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram. So they're learning politics by just looking at Instagram and social media. And I think that's a huge thing. I felt like watching Alexia Cortez, regardless of politics, I had them follow her just because she was tweeting how new congressmen get what, what they do, how they get assigned to committees. They were learning so much politics by just following her Instagram feed. Um, and I, I loved that they were coming in with me. Did you see what she did? Did you see what committee she got selected to? Like they were so engaged with it. That same type of thing. And getting back to efficacy, that is, um, you know, I think a lot of times when we think, going back to thinking about how are you civically engaged, that question we originally had, I think most of the time I would have told you, oh, you vote and you do jury duty. Like maybe 15 years ago, I would have told you that. Our kids are so active politically. They're out there doing political things on social media and that counts like that is actual lowercase d democracy at work with our students they're doing things in person and online that i couldn't even imagine 10 years ago i mean it's it's i am blown away with what kids can do and when people getting back to like you will like clapping down on young kids saying oh young kids these days they're more active than any of my peers who are my age, period. So I'm like, go for it. Great. Last question before we open it to the audience. What are some steps that you take as part of the lesson cycle before you teach controversial topics? So I start the first very day with a video called Silent Beats, um, and it's a really powerful film. If you want to look it on YouTube, it's five minutes. It's, it's called Silent Beats. I'll try to post the link in a second. But um, it talks about empathy and stereotypes and racial prejudices, and this year it's even more relevant than ever before to start the foundation with the idea of empathy and why we need to have that, and you set the ground rules of respecting each other's opinions from the very first day. That's how I start my class and start with the expectations are we're not going to agree, but we need to respect each other. And that's where we need to stand. And that's usually how I start the foundation for that. Um, for me, it's just doing my own research. Like the more I know about it, the more approachable the topic is and the more likely they are to have those discussions. And like I said, like, you know, I love podcasts. I'll watch documentaries. I read books, but if I know that I have something that is coming up. And again, I talk about, um, we teach AP Gov, we talk about Roe versus Wade. I know so much about the case law and the history because I just made it that mission. Like if we're going to have this discussion, the more I know and the more I can say, hey, if you're you know interested, <clears throat> you know, watch there's there's this documentary or there's this podcast or you know, I got to sit in the court for whole woman's health. Like when they made the decision, there's so many resources out there. So for me, um, because I had, I think that year I had every one of my classes was like 35 to 37. And it was like, if we're going to do this, I have to be the expert as much as possible. And then when they find things, um, it's just that approachable nature of the topic. So controversial doesn't have to mean scary. It doesn't have to mean everybody starts yelling at each other. It's, and again, it's going back to the question, why is this controversial? What, what exactly about this? You know, because when we talk about abortion, they're blown away to know, like, this wasn't that big of a deal. I mean, yeah, it was when Roe versus Wade happened, but it was more that like political revolution with evangelical Christians. And, you know, why is that? Why did Phyllis Schlafly, I can never say her last name, why did she attach that to the ERA? Like, what about this is controversial? And it just, it creates, again, a place of let's do research, let's look into this. And, and maybe I don't know my opinion that, and you don't have to, because we're teaching, again, this has been said over and over, but we're teaching you how to research things and how to learn more about them so that you're not making those snap judgments. And you're, again, not realizing it's not two sides. It's a very multi-dimensional argument and that's okay because we all have different pers you know, perceptions, perspectives, 
And that's the best thing. But I always start with my own research. And if I don't know where to start, I mean, we have an amazing professional learning network. Sometimes I just throw it out and say, hey, does anybody have anything really good? <clears throat> excuse me, on this topic because I want to do this in my class, but I need to know more. Also, if you ever get um, surprised by it, because there's always a kid that'll just randomly ask you a question, the best sentence stem I ever learned is, that's a really awesome question. Can I have some time to digest that and really look into it before we talk about it? Because you're also showing your students, I don't know everything. And I, I want to know. That's a really great question. And I'm not ignoring it. I just don't have an answer yet. And we did it one time. We were talking about um, immigration because we're in Arizona. And, you know, they're talking about the dreamers and everything else. And they had had a conversation in their English class that just didn't go very well and it was really frustrating. And so they asked me a question and I'm like, I don't know what the, that law is. Let me tell you what, everybody, that's what I want you to do is go home and let's look at what the law is. And if you want to take it further, what's the history of this law? Why is this a thing? And it became, and it was one class, it was my third hour. It became this like really great conversation of, Sometimes people in controversial topics say things that upset you because they haven't done that research. You can't force everybody to do research, but you can be the model of what good research is. Like, that's really interesting that you would say that. Do you know what the history of the law is? Or I disagree with you because I understand, you know, X, Y, and Z. So we ask the kids to research. I am... I mean, constantly, I'm constantly watching things, reading things, listening to things. So that's mine. I brought, I was like, oh, I have to look something up. Um, but I'll, I'll wait until later. Um, yeah, I think I love what Melissa said about understanding that controversial topics elicit emotional reactions and to create systems and networks policies, procedures, blah, 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 that encapsulate the whole child, that allow a student to be able to say, I don't want to talk about this anymore, right? Like have a way of them indicating whether they like, I mean, in my class, I mean, whatever. I'm like, just go to the bathroom and I'll see you in like 15 minutes. Um, and let's talk about it. That's my, that's my rule is that if you leave, we have to chat about it. Um, remembering that it's not about, um, you know, typically when I see, um, disagreements that get personal, it's because someone is questioning someone's experience um, and telling them that, that, that they didn't experience that. And that is, you know, just like anything else, like you just have to set norms for how you're going to behave. Um, I do love the ruler methodology from Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, which is something that is not it's like, it is for talking about emotions. It's helping kids identify emotions beyond I'm good and I'm bad. Um, it's helping kids. I mean, it's like a whole curriculum that this, one of the schools I've worked at, it was like a four year curriculum transformation. But what I love about thinking about emotional intelligence, social emotional intelligence is that you have to address how it makes you feel before you can get to the academic part and you need to know how to deal with conflict when they arise and then also plan how to deal with them and being able to anticipate them. So um, I, I love the, like I said, the ruler method, they have a lovely little app that's like the first level called the mood meter. Um, I use it with my own children. I, yes, and then like, you have to do your, you have to do your research. Um, it, time is, I mean, like, look, like we don't have all the time in the world. I, I like, I'm not going to tell you like, just buy 15 books. You'll be fine. Um, lean into your PLN, ask questions. Um, well, some of the times I've found other PLNs that are like not related to educators at all. Um, particularly when I get into like law issues, I'll ask, the law P Twitter law people and they'll they're total dorks and they're like blah, blah, just like an avalanche of like you should read Youngstown sheet and tube and history look at this like you know, I'm like oh my god it's just oh, thank you that was everything I wanted and more 
Um, so don't be afraid to ask. I, I also follow almost every author I read online. So if I have questions, usually, like I said, they love talking to you, so they will give you too much information. Um, so, and then I think the last component is recognizing, like coming up with typical ways of talking about controversy. So I also love the ruler method or not the ruler methodology, um, project zero from, I don't know where the hell it's from, Harvard, Prince, uh, one of those hoity-toity places. Um, it's a whole way of breaking down controversy and historical topics and civics um, into kind of like smaller parts. That's not necessarily um, a big blown out writing thing that um, I love. Um, so if you've ever done, I used to think, but now I think, and here's a wondering that I have, that's a project zero thing. Um, also teaching kids a little bit about the skill of what is the, like, what is the difference between a refutation, a rebuttal, an ad hominem, so on and so forth. And that's what I was looking for before I got to this. Like AP Lit does this wonderful thing where they, AP Lang does this wonderful thing with retological fallacies. I don't understand it. My brain explodes every time. But there, I found this like great, like breakdown from some random guy in the spring. Um, it's not random, but I can't remember his name right now. That just goes through like, here's all the different types of arguments. And there are certain arguments that you will always be able to defeat because if it's an ad hominem, then just attacking you. But if it's like them actually, rebutting or um, refuting your argument, then here's how you handle it. Um, and, um, you know, like I said, just coming back to the idea that like, it's about skills. It's not about winning. We're not like when kids are like, I need to win. I'm like, you're in the wrong classroom. We're not gonna, that's not, you know, we're not here. It's not a sporting arena. Um, I'm not your cheerleader. Um, it's about getting to know everyone. So I'll look for that thing while you guys bring your questions up. Great. Well, thank you so much to the panelists. Questions from the audience? You can unmute yourself or you'll want to type in a chat. Hi, I have a question. Um, I am actually a new teacher and um, it's an interesting time to start. <laughs> but um, I wanted to know how you are going about dealing with teaching in an environment where parents are now in your classroom, if they're working from home, especially in regards to these controversial issues. Any tips not to get sued? I will take them. So I, I do something really interesting and I've been doing it before COVID and this time it's now even more important. So I have them message their parents when we're learning something controversial or something interesting. So I ask their parents when we're learning about voting, for example, did you vote in the last election? Why or why not? And they came in with all these answers of why they should vote or why they shouldn't, why they didn't vote. Um, I constantly have them ask their parents, go ask a parent, go interview an adult. Um, and I did that a lot, especially with COVID-19 because they were home and it was something fun and engaging when we were talking about something to do. But I even, like I called it text a friend and that's what we would do in class. They would text somebody outside of class and ask them a question about what we learned or what we were learning about. And then you come in to class with like a hundred responses of people from all over wherever we live. And my mom said this, my aunt said this, my dad said this, and it makes it really engaging. Um, and I usually use it as a bell ringer in the beginning of class. I post, text a friend, what do you know, when was the last time you voted? Or text a friend, what do you know about affirmative action? I mean, it's amazing to bring in different perspectives and it, it's, a, it's an interesting starter, um, let's just say that. So that's what I did. And I think for me, especially as a first year teacher, it's knowing your kids. Like there are, you know, there were years that the way I taught controversial topics looked a lot different. Um, attending as, and I know that we're in an online world, but like attending PD and like stuff like this <clears throat> and just getting those ideas. And I, the biggest thing for me was always, here's the objective. Here is why we are talking about this. And then tried to make it as student driven as possible because you know, for me, again, I'm a facilitator of learning, <clears throat> but it becomes, because you're going to have that, like we're social studies teachers, people are going to say, well, you know, she's just teaching this and she's doing this, 
I got called into my superintendent. Again, we're the second largest district in the state of Arizona. So it's not a small thing. And she said, why are you teaching about abortion? And I was like, it's part of my AP government standards. Like, here is literally the objectives. Here's what happened. This is what I'm supposed to be teaching. Um, and then knowing your community. Because for me, there are certain topics, as much as I'd love to dive into them, it becomes too divisive in my classroom. And I am not about that life with those kids. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I think like Jen's posting stuff, asking people what they're doing, how they're doing it, um, and knowing that you don't have to do everything like right away. That is, I think that's my big, like welcome to teaching first of all, but that's my big thing. Start small, start basic, and then start adding on as, as you too feel more comfortable with it. Thanks so much. Welcome to teaching, Amber. What are you teaching? Um, U.S. history and American government. Oh, I got it. These are my two favorites. Yay. Okay, so here are some things that I would recommend. Um, number one, you're gonna be fine. Don't like. Don't freak out. Like, if someone tells you like, oh, by the third year, you're blah blah blah. Like, you're gonna be great. Every year is a journey. Every year is insane. Find someone who's like lightness. Don't hang out with the people who are complainers. They're the worst. Have you read that whole thing about the marigold, marigold thing? <laughs> I was just going to say that. There's an article about that. Find your yeah. marigold. <laughs> Find your marigold. Someone who supports you and isn't like, you know, th there are a lot of people who like complain and the staff room is like a number one for that. So I, my rule in the staff room is we're not allowed to talk about students. We're not allowed to talk about our job. We're just going to talk about like fun stuff. Um, cause I like to laugh. We need to, um, that being said, yeah, get to know your students. One of the most beautiful things that I've seen a brand new teacher do last year. She's like, was, she's like a year ahead of you, right? She, and I'm doing it this year. It's going to be weird, but that's okay. She interviewed every single one of her students to get to know them. And I think that when you make that, it's about building that community on day one. It's about saying like, I see you, I wanna know where, like, what are your, you know, like the, the typical thing, like you ask all the regular questions, what's your strength of schedule? Where do you wanna to go to college, blah, 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 blah. But um, just starting that conversation is going to make you more accessible. And I think that is what is so important is that kids, unfortunately, or fortunately for me, because I love it, they need more from you than just here's history. Um, you should for sure, and this is for like every teacher, don't do any role plays. Oh my God. Like, don't do role plays. If they are still doing that pre with pre-service teachers, like I'm like, that is where people get fired. Like, all the time and it doesn't like i've seen beautiful role plays from zinn where they're like let's role play rewriting the constitution with enslaved people's representation represented and i will tell you as year 14 i did that last year with some with some students and they and i was like you are not the person you were representing, you were representing their interests. And within five minutes, they were calling each other slaves. And I almost passed out and started crying. Like I was like, what are you? Stop it. You are no, 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 no. This is not what you're supposed to do. So the moral of the story is don't do any role playing. No writing in the first person. Don't do any of that. Like it's, it's so much trouble that isn't worth it's not worth it, right? They're not gonna get anything out of it that you can't get from other places. Um, I think it's really important to teach them the skills, let them know that you love them and that you're there for them, but there are limits to that. Let them um, be curious in the classroom, let them have conversations that they're already having, let them bring their culture that they are, and you, you I'm assuming you know it way better than I do, right? Bring the culture into the classroom so that they're doing things that are authentic to them and think about mastery of learning and not about that standardized test that's at the end because no one cares. <laughs> 
<laughs> nobody cares. Um, and you know, lean into the people who are around you. Don't be too bra don't be too proud to say like, Hey, can I borrow this? Can I modify it? Can I do this? And if you don't know the answer to something, I don't know the answer. I will never know the answer to everything. So there's no pressure. Like we're not, we're not Google. Like it's impossible. So that was a lot. And I hope, I hope I it's know. like, I have to take notes as we're talking. So yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> Um, speaking of not being humble, I'm scrambling the internet for lesson plan. So U.S. history teachers, I'll be. Don't at pay for it either, and I don't pay for I'm it. Like, don't pay for it, and I'm like, I'm like someone who sold stuff. Don't pay for it. Um, if you're teaching, there's like stuff on on Facebook. There are groups for government, and there are groups for a, uh, U.S. history. There's um, a guy that just started a website called Anti Racist A Push that I'm like really excited about this year. Um, you know, but it's just don't pay for that. Just ask and people will like throw it. You'll get more stuff than you could ever hope for. Um, you go. And ask, like, if you see somebody doing something that you want, ask them to be your mentor. Like, that's literally what I ended up doing. I, I switched subjects 11 years in. And, you know, after 11 years, I was like, well, I'm national board certified and I have my master's and I'm a master teacher. And then I, went from junior high to senior AP government. Um, and there was another teacher, not even in my district online. And I was like, I really like the things you do. Like, can you mentor me? And, and this is my expectation is basically, I just need somebody to bounce ideas off of. Um, and she was like, yeah. And it created this really awesome friendship, but it's also like, I had her pop into one of my classes um, just to watch me teach. Like my kids weren't there. She was just watching a webinar I was putting on for my kids and give me feedback. And it's like, at that point, I'm in year 17. I've been teaching AP Gov for six years. Like, I mean, like Jen and Melissa, I write a blog about it. Um, but it's still like, I want to, I want to do things a certain way. And so I reach out to those people and the good ones will either say, Hey, I can't right now, but maybe later, or they'll say yes, because we all want to, we, we want to be good teachers. We want our students to, but we want other teachers to be good teachers. Like that's one of the things like to speak about Jen and Melissa, like I have talked to them about, and again, all three of us write blogs, but I have never felt this, like, it's always a camaraderie. Like these are good people. These are the people I want to be with. So putting that in there too. Find those marigolds. They're so beautiful. Yes. Like people like, you know, like we love teaching. So find people who love teaching and love students and, and join those Facebook groups, join the t Twitter chats. I put in SS chat, join SS chat, join HSGov chat. I mean, there's amazing teachers out there. You'll follow them and find them and you'll get so many good ideas from them. So, and I don't write anymore. So you should follow Elizabeth and Melissa. I quit. <laughs> Twitter, <laughs> but I, if, Twitter, they well, just, yeah. if I don't teach anymore. Like I work for a nonprofit now, but I'm still working with teachers and students. But yeah, but your blog is like, oh, on, your, your, blog blog, is your blogs are on point and I haven't written anything in like three years, but there's, there's well, still awesome. Miss, I made all the AP gov videos mm -hmm. and thank you very much, by the way, for doing that. You're welcome. Yes. You're amazing. Um, yeah, just reach out. There are people will love you forever so much that you'll be like, get away. Right. And that's what you want. Those are the people you want. Yeah. Be all right. Yes. Yes. So I'm going to say then really quick that I actually now work for BRI, Yay! their teacher and student programs. Awesome. So Amber, I can throw my email in there. I'm happy to, even if it's not a BRI source and Barbara knows because I like, teaching the justice and the judicial branch was my very first teacher program and it was man it was so cool like this new job is so awesome but and i still get to work with kids also my husband teaches a push in u.s history so i still get to like help him out um but i there's i have tons of free stuff so i'm gonna pop my email in there for you do not, if, if, if in your head, you're like, well, I don't know if I should No, email me. Like I got tons of stuff I can send your way. I got lots of resources. So 
Amber, I emailed her this morning, so feel free. I'm sure she won't care. <laughs> I won't. I actually have a, um, a draft for Barbara, like going. And I was like, I need to sleep on this because I don't want to forget anything. So perfect. Thank that you. is so exciting. Congratulations. But I was wondering what it was. I was like, she's doing something fabulous. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not hesitant to say it, but I, I, I still am my own entity. Like I still like have other things. Um, but yes, it's really fun. It's really cool. I really enjoyed it. I've also enjoyed it because it still lets me be a part of iCivics. Like I still get to be yeah. in a big civic ed world um, and not boxed into something. Yes, Mary, I'm doing all the BRI seminars that are west of the Mississippi. And I'm going to give my email address as well. I have gifts also mm -hmm. places. So whenever. Gilder Lehrman, amazing. Library of Congress. Amazing. Amber, would you? Yeah. Now, Amber's just trying to like hurry up and write all this stuff down. <laughs> <laughs> trying to think of what else is out there. iCivics is amazing. Civics is so fantastic, especially. Check out um, Shag, S-H-E-G. Shag, mm -hmm. fabulous. Yeah. iCivics is great when you have classes of kids who are not all at the same level. Like it's such an easy and helpful thing. I mean, I used iCivics with AP seniors. Like they love that stuff. They mm -hmm. love the games. They love the lessons. And it's really easy. Um, it's really easy to use online. Yeah. yeah. Facebook groups are amazing. I'm trying to think there's other things that I'm like, I like, it's going to take me like 15 years to figure this one out. What else? Um, teaching American history is one. Teaching American history is amazing. Great primary source documents. Yes. Awesome. Digital history. You, University of Houston digital history is great for mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Zen education project, teaching tolerance, facing history and ourselves gets all those perspectives that are ugh, always overlooked. Mm -hmm. um, there's yeah. a great book I would buy that I highly recommend called history lessons and what it is is US history viewed from around the world of how they teach it so imagine having a book from the Japanese perspective learning World War II you have British perspective learning World War II and what I do is I get the book it's like ten dollars on Amazon it's awesome you it's called um, uh, I think it's called I'll look, I'll look it up the exact name I said it the first time and I don't remember um, history lessons uh, it it's amazing for group work. So if you're learning a new topic, how did this country view this topic? How did this country view this topic? Um, it's amazing. I can't speak enough about it if you're teaching US history. I love it. It's called How the Textbooks Around the World View That Topic. I love it. Yeah. But you don't have to use all this stuff at once. Like no. Just pick, pick one thing and then just slowly build on it because there's so much. Again, yeah. this is why what we teach is so cool. Yeah. Mary, I've never, I've never been to Virginia's thing, but I'm going to check it out. And Amber too, one of my like side gigs is I actually work with Northern Arizona University and the AZK 12 center. Um, and we do mentoring services for first year teachers. Um, and it's very structured, whatever else. But if you just need like general teaching help that has nothing to do with it, I'm actually trained to do that and happy to help you. That was actually the second half of my job last year I did. I taught AP government and then I worked with teachers. And my job is just to make sure you feel successful. It was the coolest, I mean, the job I have now is pretty cool, but that job was awesome. Mm -hmm. This is just a teacher advocate, that's it. She's on the pamphlets. <laughs> I know, that's still so weird. The green dress. <laughs> green uh, is color, I guess, but yeah, it's. Oh, there's also a, thing from, I'll look for it. There's a way of breaking down um, historical documents that for, for US history that I really love from Virginia Tech. And I'll find that and put that up there. Okay, any other questions from the audience as Jennifer's looking? I just would like to say that one benefit of COVID is that we get to do all of these things. And you, you know, we can, talk and chat and, and I've been trying to make dinner at the same time as doing this. So I didn't think you guys would, would <laughs> want to see me running around the kitchen. Um, 
but it, it really, I appreciate everything that we get. Jen Hitchcock, your, your uh, video saved my butt in AP Gov, without question. They're back. <laughs> Yay. That's what we're working on right now. Because we won't be back in school, I don't think. So, yeah, they're back. There's like, they're like, um, for each topic, I'm working on unit one right now. Um, they're not live. There's three, up to three eight minute videos that deal with content and skill. So. Well, when you had Mitch Daniels on, I'm originally from Indiana and I worked with him when he was on the Hill um, with the National Republican mm -hmm. Senatorial Committee. So when I saw he was on there, I was, oh, yay. He was I was very excited. My friends think I'm weird, but that's okay. No, it's so fun. He was lovely. I still, unfortunately, have nightmares of call, of telling Valerie Jarrett that she worked for the Trump administration. It's I'm never like like literally nightmares. Like I'm like I'm gonna throw myself down the stairs. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's it was amazing, amazing experience. So I'm glad I helped. I just want to mention I'm running a tech tool pop up tomorrow. Um, I'm gonna promote it on Twitter too, but. Um, we're going to, I'm going to just share like my five tech tools that I'm going to teach with remote learning. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I'm going to have teachers just share resources. So it's just going to be like a tech tool, not social studies related, but just teaching and theory and learning ideas. So I love it. Yeah. I'll, I'll post that on Twitter tomorrow. Okay. So Gabriel, this is recorded, right? So like yeah. all the links I can, I can steal them. Yeah. I've, and I've made a wakelet and once the video is done, I'll put, post it in the wakelet and I'll share it out with everybody. You're amazing. Uh, you, my friend, are my hero. I was just crafting a let's everybody give thanks to Gabriel for doing all of this because this is incredible. Like, this yeah. is such a big thing that you are doing for teachers. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it is like, you're amazing. incredible. You're amazing. You're the Thank king you. of social I've... studies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, team social studies. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, panelists. Uh, it was amazing. And I'll post it as soon as I get it um, finished. That's Wonderful. Thank Thanks, you. guys. It was Good nice seeing all of you. Good luck, no Amber. Likewise. Go get them. Amber, we got your back. <laughs> Bye. Bye.